Well, first of all, welcome to you all. Um, may I just introduce myself? My name is Lorna Castleton, and I'm Foreign Secretary of the Royal Society. Uh, I'd like to ask you all, please, to turn off your mobile phones, and I really do mean turn them off, because uh, we are actually being webcast this evening, so everything is being recorded, so if your phone goes off, it's not going to be very good, uh, and it will interfere with, with part of the webcasting. Uh, well, it's my very great pleasure to introduce uh, our Rosalind Franklin Award winner, this is really one of the very special occasions at the Royal Society because we are here to celebrate a woman in, in science. Uh, the Royal Society Rosalind Franklin Award is funded by the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills as part of its efforts to promote women in science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Now, the award is made to an individual for an outstanding contribution to any area of STEM, as we call it. Now, the award made annually consists of a medal, a certificate, and a grant of £30,000. The recipient is also called upon to deliver a lecture as part of the Society's public lecture series. And Professor Gupta, who will be who has this award uh, this year, has chosen tonight uh, to give that lecture. Uh, as part of the nomination process for the award, all nominees are asked to put forward a proposal for a project that would raise the profile of women in STEM, in their host institution and or field of expertise in the UK. Uh, Professor Gupta's project will involve creating a children's book displaying stories of famous female scientists throughout history. Now, all our winners of the Rosalind Franklin Award are remarkable, uh, but I think Professor Gupta is exceptionally so. Uh, she is Professor of Theoretical Epidemiology at the University of Oxford. Uh, Professor Gupta's main area of interest is the evolution of diversity in pathogens, with particular reference to the infectious disease agents that are responsible for malaria, influenza and bacterial meningitis. She was awarded the Zoological Society of London uh, Scientific Medal last year. And Professor Gupta also has an interest in the public understanding of science and the connections between science and literature. She is an acclaimed novelist and essayist. Uh, she even translates the Bengali poet Tagore. Um, she was long-listed for the Orange Book Prize in 2000 and was awarded the Southern Arts UK Prize for Literature in the same year. Professor Gupta was awarded the Royal Society Rosalind Franklin Award based on her scientific achievements, her suitability as a role model, and her proposal designed to promote women in science, technology, engineering and math. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to present Professor Sunetra Gupta. Well, thank you, Lorna, for that amazing introduction. Um, this is, of course, a very great honour, and I hope I'll be able to do it justice with this lecture. So pandemics. Uh, we all seem to be living constantly under threat of some pandemic or the other. Um, at the moment, we are experiencing what is technically a pandemic of a new strain of influenza, which appears to have originated among swine. And a lot of energy, time, attention, money is spent on thinking about how to combat the threat of a pandemic um, from the point of view of the, human, of the human host. But what I'd like to invite you to do today is consider this problem from the point um, of the pathogen. So for the pathogen, when it comes into a naive, a susceptible population, a population that's never experienced it before, 
uh, what it sees is this very, very rosy picture. It's entered a very a resource-rich environment. But once it's progressed, once the epidemic has uh, progressed through that population, um, the picture becomes rather more bleak. And this is because, essentially, when a pathogen um, affects a host, it is taking a resource and turning it into something that is no longer a resource. So the effect of a pathogen upon a host is, first of all, possibly to make it sick, and then also, um, if the host is very unlucky, the host may die. Now, that's a very direct way to remove your own resource by killing your host. What is more typical, though, is that the host will not die, but develop immunity against that pathogen. But that, too, is a process of resource removal. And indeed, the act of vaccination, which is our way of trying to take the host from being a resource to not being a resource without subjecting it to the risk of becoming sick and dying, this process has been described by um, certain biodiversity experts as a wanton act of habitat destruction. <laughs> Because, indeed, that's what we're doing. We're taking away a resource from the pathogen. Now, as I said, the pathogen itself does this um, without our help, without vaccination. And it can do this, as you can see, in two ways. It can either kill the host or, more typically, um, render it immune. Um, killing the host is perhaps adequately represented by this very bleak picture with all the trees chopped down. But making the host immune is perhaps better represented in this way, where each tree now is guarded by a little soldier. In other words, it's not as if the resource itself has disappeared. It's just that now there is a barrier for the pathogen um, to, um, in, in accessing this resource. So this is really actually the main problem that the pathogen faces in terms of um, surviving a pandemic. So what can it do? What are the options available to it? One very um, clear option is that it might be able to disguise itself. Whether it can do that depends on what it has as its, uh, at its disposal in terms of a disguise. And I hope you'll indulge me um, a little more further on the, the cartoon front uh, by allowing me to introduce here the, our protagonist, the bug, in relation to its wardrobe, which is what it will clothe itself in before it sallies forth into that orchard to wreak havoc. Now, what do these elements in the wardrobe really represent? What they are, in fact, what I'm trying to present to you in this cartoon form, um, these particular elements of its outfit are things that are recognised, parts of the bug, parts of the pathogen, that are recognised by the host immune response. But they're also, crucially, they are parts, they are crucial to the life history strategy of the bug. So they might be proteins that the bug needs in order to invade the host cell. They're all critical to the machinery of its operation, but they're also elements that are recognised by the host immune response. So the bug has to, as I said, it's these elements that they're essential for the functioning of the bug. So it has to be, it cannot... <laughs> go out there until it has clothed, clothed itself in these, um, in a, using elements of this wardrobe. And so what happens when this a particular pathogen, strange we call it, enters um, a scene like this, is that of course the immune response starts to uh, develop among the individuals within a community that it's, um, where the epidemic is occurring, and then when the bug is left, 
there is a lot of immunity to that particular strain. In other words, these soldiers that I'm showing you are on alert against something that is wearing um, a green assemblage of hat, coat, etc., but cannot recognize something that is wearing an entirely different outfit. This opens up the possibility for the pathogen to re-exploit that resource by changing elements of its outfit. So if, for example, an epidemic is caused by a particular strain, in this case one that's wearing an all-green outfit, in this, um, this sort of little square here is showing you, um, I'm calling it an epidemic window, so that little green blip there may, for example, indicate the number of cases with time, and so that's your first epidemic occurring. Um, cases increase and then they die away because people have become immune. One option for the bug is to gradually start to change its outfit until it achieves a form that is unrecognisable, that is no longer um, recognised by the prevailing immune responses, immunity, collective immunity in the community. And this thing can now cause a new epidemic. Now, this is the accepted kind of version of how something like influenza manages to come back repeatedly within a population. This is not um, the explanation for why we get pandemics, but in the inter-pandemic period, why influenza keeps recurring is um, conventionally assumed to be due to this, this sort of a process. In other words, in biological terms, what um, is seem to assume to happen is that the influenza virus mutates, it changes genetically until it can no longer be re recognized by the immune hosts. And this gradual process of accumulating differences of slowly altering the outfit is known as antigenic drift. And that is how people have so far seen the evolution of influenza in the interpandemic periods. Now, again, just to anchor this in some real biology, it's not all cartoons, um, what are we talking about here when we say influenza alters its outfit? Well, as I said, these um, ingredients of its wardrobe actually do correspond to parts of the pathogen that are recognised by the host immune response, and in influenza, the, um, strong, the, the candidates, strongest candidates for, um, uh, uh, that, that correspond to these elements um, would be on the surface of a particular protein um, that sits on the surface of the virus. And it's called hemagglutinin. And it, has, it plays a very crucial role in getting the virus into the host cell. And because... It's the attachment point for the virus to the host cell. It is exposed to the immune host immunity. And there are certain sites that have been identified on the hemagglutinin uh, protein that are where antibodies, which are a part of the immune response, which is where they bind and effectively um, mess up the influenza virus. And so these antigenic sites would, could, uh, what we have here as, as the outfit, could correspond very specifically to those antigenic sites. And in, when there are genetic changes, mutations in the gene that encodes this protein, you can get an alteration that effectively corresponds to this bug donning a new uh, a vest of a new colour. So this is just to show you that it's not just some kind of cartoon fantasy. This is representing a very, very specific 
reality. Um, that's the influenza virus. What I'd like to bring to your attention is that not all bugs have this privilege. Measles, for instance, has a very, very unimpressive wardrobe. It only has effectively one outfit in the wardrobe. Why, why does it only have one outfit? Well, essentially, the elements that the immune system recognises in, for the measles virus are bits of it that it really can't afford to change. So when the measles virus puts on its outfit and goes forth to try and uh, make its home, exploit the, the host population as a resource, it um, has to be wearing the same dress. By contrast, as I've mentioned in flu, the, the wardrobe is much richer, and also, as it is also for um, some of the parasites that cause human and other malarias. And as um, Lorna mentioned, malaria is one of my primary interests, so I'm going to devote a little time now to talking about malaria. So what we've got here are two different life history strategies. We've got measles, which only has one outfit, um, and then malaria, which has a number of outfits, and therefore has the option of emerging in a variety of combinations of these different outfits. The fact that measles only has one outfit is reflected in um, that when we get measles, we only get measles once. So once you've got measles, you have lifelong immunity against measles. So most people do not get measles more than once. Whereas with malaria, um, you get infected and indeed diseased repeatedly. So once you've had malaria, you can't rest assured that you will never get malaria again. On the contrary, you will get malaria repeatedly. So about 20 years ago, I was trying to understand what it was that created, generated, maintained this kind of diversity in malaria and how it related to the epidemiology of malaria. And one of the first things that struck me, among a jigsaw of other observations, was that malarial disease could not really be seen on a very simple axis of mild and severe, as in you either had a bad case of malaria or not such a bad case of malaria. Malarial disease seems to, organize, to be organised into quite different clinical syndromes. For example, severe malaria, which is what kills a very large number of children still every year um, in the millions, um, severe malaria can be resolved, although clinicians will forever argue about this, into two discrete syndromes, one of which is severe malarial anemia, which is a profound anemia that occurs in really very, very young children. And another very distinct syndrome is cerebral malaria, where the malarial parasite, which lives for much of its life within the red blood cell, manages to clog up the um, brain blood vessels in the brain, leading to a whole sequence of pathologies which often causes death. So it seemed to me, looking at, at malaria as a disease, as an infection, um, looking at it, the patterns of malaria, its age distributions, various epidemiological features, that what was going on in malaria was... Not that we saw this nice big soup, this mush of parasitic um, material or, or parasites wearing a, a variety of different garments in all kinds of combinations, but rather as if they were organised into discrete, distinct tribes, none of which shared any part of its outfit with the other. So... What this sort of conceptualization allowed, allows us to explain is why you have different diseases. A simple explanation would be, well, if you have effectively different tribes, different independent strains of malaria, um, it's easy to conceive of why one particular tribe would cause one particular disease 
syndrome and another tribe would cause another. So this was only one of the pieces of the jigsaw that seemed to fit together under this assumption. But again, returning to what giving uh, what, what we actually mean, what, what does this business of different tribes and what do these elements of its outfit mean when it comes to malaria? What, what, I was, what we're really talking about in malaria, the primary target of the immune response in malaria is this protein that the parasite, so this plasmodium is the name of the, the parasite that causes malaria, it lives, as I said, for a large part of its life within the red blood cell. And while it's hiding within the red blood cell, it nonetheless puts out, it sticks onto the surface of the red blood cell these uh, proteins, which are called PFEMP1. And what these proteins actually enable it to do is stick to the blood vessel lining, which is important for the parasite because, among other things, it helps the parasite to stay stuck to the, red, uh, to the vessel lining and not be trafficked into the spleen, which is an organ of the body where it might get recognised as a very wonky um, red blood cell and destroyed. The genes that are responsible, that code for the, these proteins, are called VAR genes, and in particular, one parasite carries, in fact, about 60 copies of these VAR genes that encode for different colours and flavours, if you like, of PFEMP1. In other words, different um, colours of these different garments. So each of these garments, in a way, corresponds to a different VAR gene. That's um, how you'd translate this into the context of malaria. Um, as I've said, what this um, gene does is encode for a protein that PFEMP1, which is inserted into the erythrocyte, which is the red blood cell membrane, and what that does is it helps it stick to a variety of surfaces um, and cells. And because of this property of sticking to different surfaces, it's easy to justify why different combinations of VAR genes may have properties that make it stick, for example, for instance, um, more to tissues in the brain and thereby cause cerebral malaria. So the story hangs together at, at that level. But then the real question that I set out to answer, well, actually, um, this was the idea, so, you know, one puts this forward to the malaria community and they immediately come back saying, don't be ridiculous. How could different tribes as such, how could malaria exist as a set of different strains? How would these different tribes be maintained? So one might be tempted to answer that question by saying, well, maybe they just started off that way and they don't exchange any clothes. They don't mix with each other. Certainly that is one way that you could maintain that kind of structure in, in any kind of population. However, when it comes to malaria, that is a complete nonsense. We know sex is an obligatory part of the malaria life cycle, and there's ample evidence that they are exchanging clothes like mad. So it's not that they started off that way and never exchanged any clothes with each other. That's not a good explanation. So in order to try and answer this question of how can a population that ought to be a soup of individuals wearing different combinations of clothes or having different combinations of, of VAR genes, how could they segregate into, into this? Um, I developed a mathematical model, which I'm not going to explain to you, but I just wanted you to have a little glimpse at the machinery that um, we use in our field to try and understand these questions of evolution and epidemiology. And these are differential equations describing how parts of the population that are immune to particular strains, um, immune to strains that share um, garments, if you like, with other strains, um, how they change with time. What they encode, essentially, are very specific biological assumptions. And the biological assumption 
that is encoded within this model is represented here again as a cartoon, is essentially this, that the immune system or an immune response which has seen a particular strain, let's say this, this green strain, now has orders to destroy anything, any parasite, wearing either a green hat, a green top, a green skirt, or green shoes. And what the model shows is that that pressure on this kind of a population, even though they're madly exchanging clothes, can cause them to self-organise, to spontaneously organise into tribes that don't share any clothes. Why would they be doing this? Well, essentially what they're trying to do is avoid competing with each other. They're trying to exploit a resource in the best possible way, and that way turns out to be by not sharing any garments with members of other tribes. In other words, when a member of this tribe tries to infect somebody else, if they have seen any, one of, any member of any of these other tribes, they will not have any immune responses that can um, destroy or prevent infection by this individual. This individual can only be blocked by members of its own group. And in this way, it actually maximizes the exploitation of the, the resource. So what this implies, of course, is that each strain of Plasmodium falciparum, which is the bug that causes the malaria I'm interested in, consists of a unique set of those genes that encode for those sticky proteins um, and correspond to the elements of the wardrobe. So is that true? Well, the answer is that we still don't know. It's been about 15 years now since this theory has been abroad, but we still don't know. One of the reasons we don't know is because each um, uh, bug, each parasite, each Plasmodium falciparum parasite, has 60 copies of this VAR gene. The gene itself is extremely complicated, and people have only just started to sequence um, little parts of it. But most importantly, just sequencing it isn't really going to give us um, enough information or be able to answer this question. These sequencing, the genetic, this genetic information has crucially to be related, particularly in the case of falciparum, to what we uh, call serological data, or other functional data. The serological data, which um, here, by, by which I hear mean data on whether people, it, the immune responses of one person can recognize the parasites of another person. This kind of exercise can yield a lot of information about the relationship between different parasite strains. And you can perform laboratory assays to which show whether the immune responses of one person, the blood, the sera of one person, can recognize not just obviously their own parasites, but parasites taken out of another person. If they do recognize them, if they don't recognize them, um, the parasites, you see a particular picture where the parasites are just scattered about, and whereas if they do have antibodies that recognize parasite, they clump together, they agglutinate. So you can use these sorts of assays to try and disentangle the relationships between different parasites that people are carrying, and what you end up with is often is, is a pattern, a sort of checkerboard pattern, where you have the parasites taken out of a bunch of different people. Sorry, that's this axis. And you test it against the blood of those people, and you get a pattern of recognition, which you can then interpret with the genetic data to get a true answer, a true picture of what the population structure is like. And one of my former graduate students, um, Caroline Bucky, is working in um, collaboration with Peter Bull and Kevin Marsh and Chris Newbold in um, Kalifi in Kenya um, to answer this, uh, these questions using these methodologies and um, developing kind of quite sophisticated network techniques to study these patterns and relate them to um, the sequence data. 
But that's just to tell you how we're going testing this hypothesis. But essentially, as I said, the jury is still out. We really don't know yet what's going on with plasmodium falciparum. It's going to take a while. So as I said, I mean, this um, idea that things, the immune response might organize things into separate tribes um, came about about 15 years ago. And that was about the time that they'd only just found this gene, cloned that gene. So obviously, I wasn't going to wait around forever to see whether this was true. And instead, at that point, very luckily, turned my attention to a different pathogen, uh, which is Neisseria meningitides, and was very fortunate to meet up with Martin Maiden, with whom I have been collaborating since, to find out whether the same sorts of processes occur within this bug, which is a bacterium, is responsible for meningitis. And this is my theoretician's cartoon of what the bug looks like. Again, I don't want to go into any detail and don't have the time to either, but I just want you to focus on a particular protein, again, an important antigenic um, an antigen, a, a part of the bug that the host immune response recognizes. And this protein has two regions which are very, very variable and, again, are recognized by um, the host immune response and effectively correspond, again, to two different garments of many, many different colors. And what, um, when I met Martin, he and his colleague Ian Fevers already had a collection of um, samples from patients with meningitis um, collected in England and Wales over this period. And they had looked at the combinations of those two um, garments. If you don't mind, Martin. Um, and what they saw, what this diagram indicates without going into detail of, um, in too much specific detail, is that the pattern of garment sharing that was observed in this sample that corresponded, bore out um, the predictions of the model in that <coughs> no two, um, two parasites never shared, they, they occurred, the combinations that were observed were not, certainly not random and indeed were non-overlapping. In other words, no, garments were not shared between, um, parasite, um, between the bacteria. So, and M Martin and I continuing to study these um, the Nicaea, the meningococcus, in other areas as well in the world to try and establish whether this pattern holds. And so far we seem to, it's looking good. So what I'd like to turn to for the final part of my talk is whether these principles, this principle of immune selection imposing structure on the pathogen population, whether it can also explain the population dynamics of influenza, by which, again, I mean not, not the emergence, the occurrence of pandemics, but the fact that within, between, in between pandemics, influenza does tend to come back at regular periods, uh, as we know, in an altered state. And so I teamed up with um, a bunch of guys here, which uh, I assure you is not a police lineup. And <laughs> we exploited a particular feature of this model that I just showed you, which encapsulates, has that assumption in it that if um, an immune response, if um, the, an uh, an individual's been infected by a particular strain, they will then mount an immune response that recognizes and causes problems for things that share any of the um, antigenic variants um, of that original strain. Um, what I've already shown you is that when these immune responses are strong, they will structure the population into these discrete tribes that don't share any... Um, garments. But what we also know is that if these immune responses are not quite so strong, a variety of behaviors can occur within 
this um, system, some of which I studied with um, Neil Ferguson uh, 10 years ago. But one particular behavior which we think may uh, applies to influenza is that rather than organizing it stably into discrete tribes, what can happen within the system is you get a sequential emergence of different tribes. So rather than them all being present at the same time, one comes up, then it goes down, then another very, very different thing comes up, and it goes down, it's followed by another thing. What's happening here again is the fundamental driving force here is to try and be as different as possible from what came before. So we believe that this kind of process can explain the population dynamics of influenza. How does that differ from the conventional wisdom, which is what I presented to you early on in this talk? Well, the conventional wisdom is that the virus mutates gradually, incrementally acquires um, a different set of clothes. It keeps, take, first takes off its vest, and then it takes off its, gets a new vest, and it changes its skirt, and then it changes its shoes, and eventually, after a um, particular period, it evolves into something that can no longer be recognized by the host. And this is, as I said, it's known, this process is known as antigenic drift. What this idea is really predicated on is the virus having a very limited access to an unlimited wardrobe. In other words, it's able to creep in and choose one outfit, but it has to do it in order for the whole thing to work, in order for antigenic drift to explain the population dynamics for in, of influenza. It, this process has to be moderate, it has to be slow, and certainly the general conception of what, what influenza is doing is that it's traveling through this rather large antigenic space. Um, and it's the distance, the antigenic distance between um, successive strains is ever increasing. So it's kind of traveling in, in one direction through this very large antigenic space. In other words, it's slowly picking out outfits one at a time that allow it to creep through what seems to be a very, very large wardrobe. And the fact that we conceive of this wardrobe as being very large is, in some senses, what underlies our fear of influenza, because what we're really thinking is, who knows what outfit, what disguise it will adopt next. Our theory, by contrast, um, is one that allows it unlimited access to quite a limited wardrobe. And um, Eddie Holmes believes that the correct name for this theory is uh, rather than antigenic drift, it's one of antigenic thrift. So instead of having this massive wardrobe, which is a very small wardrobe, but you're allowed to access it as regularly as you like. What does that mean? Well, it means when that first epidemic occurs, rather than gradually trundling along and acquiring different elements to its disguise, within our model, what would happen next is you'd have an explosion of um, outfits, uh, combinations of, of clothes. But, as I've said, the immune system has orders to shoot anyone wearing either a green hat, a green top, green skirt, or green shoes. And so the fate of most of these types is that they get eliminated. They are not successful. And the one woman left standing in this particular case is the one which is not sharing any part of its outfit with the strain that came before. And this can then cause a new epidemic. So what our model shows is that you can have a, an emergence, sequential emergence of unique antigenic types with, under a very simple set of rules and in a way that is independent of the mode and tempo of mutation. So it doesn't matter how slowly the virus is changing or how fast it's changing or whether it has a sequence in the wardrobe that it can access one after the other. And what we're suggesting is that it's the shifting landscape of host immunity 
that really determines when a new strain emerges rather than the mutational capabilities of the virus. So how does that affect our understanding of flu in a way that's meaningful? Well, let me just discuss one particular implication. We've been worried, as you probably know, before swine flu, there was bird flu. So we've been worried for a long time about bird flu. Now, if this sort of process is also occurring within an avian population, which we have every reason to believe um, it does, then what you have is, again, this, the machinery chug, um, chugging along and throwing, generating these successive epidemics. And what we might have been observing, really, is just the rise and fall of a particularly nasty strain. Nasty in the sense, particularly, that when it gets into humans, it causes our lungs to uh, liquefy. So, but what this implies is that it's as likely, it's more likely, in fact, that this nasty strain will just disappear rather than getting nastier. There isn't any reason to assume, not at least within the machinery that is causing it, allowing it to behave as it does within a population, that it's going to incrementally acquire further characteristics that are going to make it nastier. It's as likely, or perhaps more likely, that it will just go away. And indeed, um, it seems from the figures of human cases that it is doing just that. I'd like to end by moving away from our soldier here, who is, of course, the big honcho here, and has orders to specifically destroy anyone wearing these particular elements, which, of course, are different between strains. And also, but and draw your attention to some of the other things that are going on during the process of infection. You don't just have a... There are dominant or principal, if you like, expert immune responses that are attacking very specific things. But you also often have rather less um, effective immune responses that are targeting something that is common to all the pathogen types. And so here we've got our little boy with the sling, and he's targeting that rather spindly leg there. And that, so this is an, not a very good immune response against something that is a common determinant that's shared between different strains. So while our expert, our, our big man there, can't recognize a new strain, the little guy can actually fire his little catapult and not destroy, but slightly discomfort, disable a new strain. And what that means is that while previous exposure may not necessarily protect against infection by a different strain, previous exposure may reduce the severity of disease that's caused by a new strain. Some work that I did with Bob Snow and Chris Newbold about 10 years ago did indicate that in malaria, that is definitely the case, that your first or second exposure confers a very large degree of protection against its very severe manifestations. And there's also evidence mounting now that with influenza, this is also the case. Note, for example, that the people who got, got a, the, the few people who did get H5N1 were not the poultry workers or the swan blood curd makers who are constantly exposed to avian influenza, but really very, very naive people. Um, and there are now studies that characterizing their immune responses against um, avian influenza, which indicate that there is protection offered by exposure to different strains. I think this is a very underutilized, underexploited means of protecting ourselves against pandemics. So um, although there are group, many, uh, one particular kind of way in which people are working to make vaccines against malaria or influenza is by somehow boosting, artificially boosting these not very good immune responses. So trying to increase the population of these 
immune responses that are naturally not very effective. That's certainly one route of exploiting this. But I think that it's what's underappreciated is that just having even that one little guy does make a difference in terms of whether you're going to get sick and die or not, which is, after all, what we really want to avoid. And I think that we should, instead of having this policy that seems to be increasingly pervading um, at various quarters, that we must somehow go hunt down and kill every possible emergent infection. I think we should focus a little bit more on how we can develop strategies of protecting ourselves against the severe consequences of pandemics. The, the more, um, what we really want to do is to make sure that we don't die, that we don't suffer severe disease. And I think focusing on some of the immune responses that are not the big ones that are structuring the population, but the little ones that are diminishing, that, that are um, just hurting the pathogen enough to protect us from severe disease is a very useful line of inquiry in that regard. So I'd like to end with my acknowledgements. I've mentioned um, Mario Recker and Caroline Bucky, who are both uh, former graduate students who have um, responsible for much of this work. Oliver uh, Pibus, Sean Nee, um, collaborated on the flu project. Sean is also involved in um, the very beginnings of this sort of model. I've <coughs> mentioned Neil Ferguson, with whom I developed this model while we were both in Roy Anderson's group. And um, with the bacterial work, Martin Maiden, Keith Jolly and Fevers, Paula Kreutz. With malaria, I have a whole host of people to thank, Chris Newbold, Bob Snow, Kevin Marsh, Karen Day, Brian Greenwood. I'm sure the list is not exhaustive. And I'd very much like to thank Robert May for pretty much everything. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Well, I'm sure you found that as impressive as I did, getting across a very complex subject with some wonderful cartoons. And I think this says just how good that book is going to be, <laughs> that is going to promote an interest in, in uh, women scientists. Well, it's time for questions now. Um, if you wish to answer a question, I want you to stand up, say who you are, and accept a microphone from the people who have microphones. Okay, and there's a question over there very quickly. Hello, my name is Kurenjit Grover. The question I'd like to ask is, does the HIV virus work in the same way? Well, that's actually something, interestingly, that I'm exploring now. Um, not so much at the level of how it spreads within the population, but how it manages to uh, become chronic within the host. So it faces effect, essentially the same problem. It's got probably not an ex uh, inexhaustible wardrobe. It probably has, because of functional constraints and because the virus has a job to do, it probably actually has a limited wardrobe, but it manages to utilise it very effectively to draw out the infection for long periods of time. And so certainly some of these processes may well um, enable it to, to achieve chronicity within the host. Question over there, and then I'll take yours afterwards. <coughs> uh, hi, my name's Phil Harris. Um, I just want to ask, the chief medical officer has blunted uh, swine flu parties as irresponsible. Uh, I don't know if this is a media myth, but do you think there's any mileage for parents, as it were, exposing their teenage offspring at least to limited versions of uh, viruses or pathogens in this regard? Or is it completely irresponsible? Um, I'd send my children to swine flu parties. <laughs> <laughs> Can 
Yeah, hi, my name's Roger Hatch. Continuing on your analogy with the cartoons, if I may, um, the nasty bugs, they, if I understood you correctly, this is, you implied that they, what drives them to change their clothes is a change in the host environment. But you didn't take that any further. Now, what, what causes the change in the host environment to make the nasty bugs want to change the clothes? Well, the nasty bugs themselves cause the change in the host environment in that they make the host immune. So now the host environment is no longer a lovely resource for the bug. So they have to start to disguise themselves in order to exploit that environment again. So that's the change in the environment, if you like. You need, a, you need a microphone to be heard, I'm afraid. So and <laughs> your answer, lovely, though, was, didn't sound to me as if there was a change in the environment. It depends on what you mean by environment, I suppose. Sorry, you used the phrase. Yes, for me, the environment is um, the host itself as a resource. Yeah. That's the environment. But, 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 what makes, but what makes that change? The bug comes in, you mount an immune response... So now the environment is no longer accessible, the environment of you. So you, imagine, you get flu, you're an environment for flu, an environment that flu can exploit. You then mount immune responses to flu that kill flu. So now for that strain of flu, you are no longer a very good environment. So it goes away and changes to something else. Question over there. And then one over there. Thank you for your talk. Um, my question is about uh, virulence. And I, I heard an interesting talk recently by uh, Bonnie Bassler about quorum sensing and how virulence is launched uh, when a certain quorum uh, threshold is reached. Now, your talk is about seeing thing, uh, surviving the um, epidemic from the pathogen's perspective. So if, if they could prevent their, um, themselves from reaching the virulent stage then surely the, the, the longevity of the infection would be greater. Well, as you notice, there were two sort of pathways, weren't there? So you can either... The worst thing you can do is just kill your host. However, there's a trade-off there because sometimes the very processes that make the host sick and become at risk of dying are ones that also promote transmission. So, the, you know, it's playing a very tricky game. So at one level... That's the first thing it has to sort out. Is it has to optimise its level of virulence in the population to, um, in fact, to outcompete other bugs that are um, also trying to optimise the level of virulence. But once it's... So I suppose really what we're saying is there are different elements to the life history strategies of a pathogen. One of them is to balance its virulence to optimise its transmission. And if I may sneak in an extra little question. It's, um, how do viruses do quorum sensing? Oh, I don't think they do. Oh, Maybe. so how do they control, um, <laughs> how do they control virulence? Oh, I that's not the only way that you control okay. virulence. It's an adaptive trait. Thank you. There was a question back there, yes. Hello, Joe Parker. Um, Sinetra, two questions arising from your stuff which I thought was very interesting. The first one would be, um, malaria is obviously a very old disease, but conditions in human populations generally have changed greatly over the past couple of hundred years um, with regard to human population sizes, and of course um, humans are travelling around a lot more. Does that mean that the tribe system might break down over time? And the second question is, HIV is obviously a much newer disease in a, a host population that's only just... Um, been exposed to it and hasn't even acquired immunity. But I suppose if humans did acquire immunity to HIV, would that imply, would your results for malaria imply that a similar tribe kind of system might arise for HIV as well? Well, the, the problem with HIV is, of course, that it remains infectious for such a long period within the host, that it's under a different set of selection pressures Notionally, yes, it could self-organise into different antigenic types. Um, but it depends on how 
strong the selection pressure actually is within a population. And that's something that um, we'll have to see, as you say. We'll have to see how, how that pans out. In terms of malaria, is it all going to break down um, now that people are traveling more? Well, um, certainly there will be change. I mean, there are geographical differences in malarial strains. And one of the things I forgot to actually mention is that one thing that is becoming very, very clear in, with the sequencing <laughs> work is that different diseases are attached to different VAR genes. And, and then we also know that these VAR genes are geographically quite different. So um, when they all mix up, they should still eventually, it, it should come out in the wash as a bunch of discrete strains. Um, but at the moment, it's probably more sensible to think of them as systems where this is operating, which are sort of loosely connected to each other. And so effectively, I think, within each system, you will see this sort of structure. But there are connections now developing between these systems, which are leading to a kind of larger melting pot where you will, again, get this structure, but perhaps more uniformly, in fact, at a global level. Well, there's a question there. Oh, that you asked you, you wanted to ask a question earlier, didn't you? No, it was before me. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm Oleg Desseberger from Cambridge. Uh, you said in one of your recent papers that the changes in the hemagglutin, in which you have very carefully analyzed, do not reflect changes which may occur elsewhere in the genome. And this uh, made me think of the uh, recent data from uh, Dr. Tompe's uh, laboratory, where he showed that uh, transmissibility in a ferret model was uh, very closely um, uh, segregated very closely with changes in one of the polymerase genes. And I just wondered whether you have data on the viruses which you analyzed for the hemagglutinin with regard to, for instance, uh, PB2 in the position 627. Well, one of the things I haven't touched on here um, is the fundamental sort of fitness or other components of the genome that, that render particular strains fitter than others, if you like, or just more successful at a, let's say, at a metabolic level. Um, what I focused on this talk for, because we haven't had time, is really how the genes, the antigen genes are structured. But in, in fact, um, with Martin um, Maiden, I have been working on trying to understand how metabolic genes would also be organized under these kinds of selection pressures. And what we see is that you do get structure there and of a different kind, but they go together hand in hand. So you're absolutely right. What we need to do with the influenza model is to do what we've been doing with Neisseria and try and bring together the antigenic components with the other genes which um, define other metabolic properties and see how they evolve together. Now, I know there's three people who want to ask a question. I'd like them to be quite short. Could we have you first? Oh, in, a, in a green jersey. <laughs> and then I'll take... Richie Goldstein, and NIMR. Um, I was interested in terms of your theory how things change qualitatively with the number of different objects, the number of different items in the outfit. Because I'm thinking, for instance, with influenza, you could have a significant shift in antigenic properties with a um, single mutation. While you have 60 VAR genes, I'm, I'm thinking if you have five different colors, that's five to the 60 mm -hmm. different possible outfits, the possibility of, getting, of finding another coherent outfit would be zero. Um, so I'm just wondering, qualitatively, how do things change with the number of different items of clothing that these things can... Well, uh, can the... Um, <laughs> The whole system is essentially governed by the item of clothing, which has the least possible numbers, uh, options to it. So if you, have, if, if you only have five different hats, then you can actually only have five different independent strains. So 
yes, it is uh, harder to see how 60 different VAR genes can <laughs> segregate into different types than I suspect, and indeed the work that Caroline and her colleagues have been doing does show that there are perhaps some of them, there's a lot of structure anyway within those 60, so some are perhaps more dominant in terms of um, eliciting a protective immune response, and those may well be structured in this way, whereas others which are performing other functions aren't quite so structured. So yes, of course, the answer is going to be a lot more complicated than what's suggested by the simple model. Great, Kate. Can we? Carol Stevenson. I was thinking of what you were saying, immunity uh, then drives the development of a, a new aggressive strain by causing it to change its, its uh, clothes, you might say. Should we be encouraging our pharmaceutical companies to develop weak vaccines which, tar which use the, the, weaker, the slingshot type of model rather than going for the big, strong vaccines that will then drive another change of, of the uh, pathogen? Well, I don't think it's quite as simple as that because some of those stronger responses are, are actually very, the naturally acquired responses. And um, in any case, most vaccine, many vaccinologists are focusing at the moment on the weaker responses in order to, but not to keep them weak, actually to boost them, to make them strong. So really what kind of antigenic change will be driven by any of these vaccines is specific to each system. Um, I'm going to have to draw this to an end because we are running out of time. Can you be ever so quick? Because yeah. <laughs> I've, I've got to do the best thing this evening, I, which is to get I actually her... thought the chair lady was against me. But, uh, <laughs> I've had my hand up. The reason is that what you've just proposed, Professor Gupta, is exactly what my own personal story bears out. I had the Asian flu very severely in 1957, and since then I've only had the flu twice. And I don't have the flu jab each year because I might have it for A and it turns out to be B. So I haven't had the flu jab for over 20 years, and I'm still here to be able to address the last question to you. You might be interested, it bears out your hypothesis, and I'm well, still alive. That's a wonderful way to end this. <laughs> Well, it is, um, it is my pleasure now to present uh, Professor Gupta with your scroll. Thank you very much. And your medal. Thank and you. And once again, may we thank Professor Gupta for a really wonderful lecture. What a